Good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome you all to the APRU Sustainable Waste Management Global Lecture Series. My name is Paul Park, a student at Korea University, and I'm going to host this event together with Professor Ong. Before starting today's event, I would like to invite Andrea Viviana to provide some technical instructions for the webinar logistics to the attendees. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being with us in the seventh lecture of Global Lecture Series. As Paul mentioned, I'm going to collaborate with the webinar logistics today. Here are some recommendations to consider during this event. This is a webinar mode, so you can listen and see the panelists, and it's possible to interact through the following tools. We have enabled two chats. You can ask questions to our speaker through the Q&A chat, and on the general chat, you can leave comments or important information. If you are interested to talk, Please raise your hand and I will unmute you so you can interact directly with the panelists. As this is an international event, we kindly ask you to use the English name all the time. Thank you and we hope you enjoy the conference. Thank you, Bibiana. So in this occasion, we are lucky to have Christina Schoenleber, the Senior Director, Policy and Research Program, APRU, who will introduce APRU as well as the APRU Global Health Program. Uh, Ms. Schoenleber, welcome and please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Let me please uh, share my slides with you. I'm Christina Schoenleber, the Senior Director of Policy and Programs, and I just want to do a quick introduction of APAU, um, which is um, partnering with the Sustainable Waste Management Program uh, on this series. So what is APAU? We are a network of leading universities uh, in the Asia Pacific. We were set up in 1997, and I have to say we are not a university. What we do is we collaborate with our members, with our university members and our partners to leverage the uh, expertise from our members and the collective network as a, and APAU acts as a platform um, to do good within the region and globally. And we do this through programs such as the Seminole Waste Pension Program, which is hosting this amazing series. Our membership at the moment consists of 60 universities across 19 economies across the Asia Pacific. Basically, we're all based around the Pacific uh, Ocean. And you can see here the list of uh, universities and you may also look if you can find your own university. Uh, within there and uh, where we are spread across. But we work uh, with many other external partners and as, a, as an open network really on key issues in the region. Well, how do we do this? Um, it's, a, it's a tall order to say we will solve challenges of the region, um, but we have to be very successful. We do it because we are a connected and a collaborative, we work very collaboratively across the network. Um, and it's a very diverse uh, region, and we also have a very diverse network, so we can address um, the issues of the region. We have expertise on global issues through our network of members and partners, and the aim is always to collaborate for impact, to achieve results, um, and to support governments in the region in addressing key issues. So... Um, through the work of our program, so we have a number of, we have um, quite a lot of programs actually running, and um, the key objective of these programs is to uh, support, through their work, to shape higher education in the Asia Pacific, which clearly makes a complete sense as being a university network. We also want to um, have an impact in creating global student leaders. These are, our students are the leaders of tomorrow. They will, what we may start with addressing challenges, the students will continue with the work either as uh, university experts, if they stay in education, or through working with uh, external stakeholders, in industry or civil society or foundations. And then through the work through our programs, we really do address uh, age specific challenges, which now more and more now are global challenges really. It's just uh, the, the way they're possibly being addressed or many of those challenges um, need to have a, a bigger focus on the Asia Pacific region, which is such an important region um, in terms of uh, economy, but also biodiversity and many other areas that we are talking about. 
So um, I specifically look after our, what we call research related program areas. And you can see all of these uh, that we are currently um, running or have in development on this slide. And clearly you know all about the sustainable waste management program, which is hosting this series. And I now want to briefly talk about our global health program, which uh, you will have the pleasure to listen to the program director, Professor Melissa with us in a few minutes um, to hear her talk. So, um, but there, these other programs are also other areas that we are addressing and we are dealing with. So global health program has been, is one of our longest running research related program areas um, in uh, APOU. And it really it fosters discussions on health worldwide and responds to APU institution needs for capacity building uh, education and research. So these are these capacity building education research address some of those three pillars that are, uh, in terms of education, leadership and solving challenges. And uh, the program does this by drawing the skills and resources expertise of the network, but also of uh, external partners. And we seek to positively transform and safeguard the health of the global population. And as you can imagine, this program has been in great demand in the last one and a half years through the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, which has been raging in this region as well as globally. So how do we do this? Um, again, as I said, it's a, it's a tall order, um, but we, um, our program, so specifically this program, is really very good uh, in developing a strong network of regional scientists and external partners to collaborate, to really uh, work together on key issues that are of interest to them, to find solutions or to advance um, advance the discussion in relation to solutions, we build capacity, we um, develop new programs, uh, we uh, apply the um, expertise of our network to new activities. And this may well be in terms of papers, in terms of books, but in terms of collaborating with external partners, also very much student focused activities, such as we've just started the uh, APU student um, climate change simulation, which is a, a new program. Um, and it's been very successful. And it also shows that uh, global health goes across many, many areas that need to be now really pertinent need to be addressed. Um, facilitating collaboration with scientists, partners, policymakers. So the program works with APEC, uh, is, uh, has strong collaborations within APEC. We also uh, draw on external partners such as AWS, um, and um, many others that we want to, that we bring in and help collaborate and work with us. And also come up in terms of new ideas, what can be done and spread the word and spread the knowledge. And then clearly it's leveraging the late, latest research within our network. This is uh, the scientists. So as I said, APU, the programs are not, they don't do their own research. It's the scientists that do their research and they bring their knowledge in and through collaborations and developing a platform, we can develop new ideas and, and new programs. And this, for example, series is also very important to, to build capacity, for example, and develop ideas around this. Um, so, so here are some just activities to use because I mean these um, uh, our aims and missions are I think are great and how do you translate this is sometimes more difficult but in a network building is through uh, clearly activities we have um, for example the global health conference and so we have an annual conference this year will be held at Hong Kong Uni University of Hong Kong um, and clearly do sign up to it um, if you haven't yet this is the global um, student um climate change simulation that has just been running which is uh, fantastic new activities that really was initiated by, by professor withers um, we have very good teaching and learning activities which is really to rally uh, uh, academics um to uh, also adapt to new situations we all need to be much more adaptable uh, the mini certificate in health research ethics and also the ethics case studies a discussion group this is really facilitated and uh, um, the idea came through um, and understanding um, or through COVID-19 and really realizing the needs and what, what is missing in terms of capacity building through the network and then the program picking up on these uh, key activities. So um, you can go 
to our website, apau.apu.org to find out more on these activities. And then finally, I just want to hear, um, I show you the pictures of, of uh, Professor Melissa Withers, who runs the program, has been running it very successfully for, for several years. And then other key colleagues are my um, Tina Lin, who's our senior program officer who supports the program. So we, we internally uh, provide support to our programs and work very closely with the program directors. And do contact us if you've got any questions or go to our website and find out more. And hopefully we'll uh, see you um, more collaborative activities across the stable waste management and the global health program going forward. And then I shall um, stop sharing my machine and my screen. Thank you very much. And I look forward to a lecture. Thank you very much uh, for the fascinating introduction of the APRU. APRU SWM Global Lecture Series is organized by the APRU SWM in Korea University. APRU SWM program is led by Professor Yong Chi Bok and co directed by Professor William Mitch at Stanford University and Professor David Wordle at Nanyang Technological University. Today's lecture will be delivered by Professor Melissa Withers from University of Southern California, USA. The title of the lecture is Promoting Health and Wellness in the Global Workforce. Now, I would like to invite Professor Yong Chi Bok to give the welcome address. Uh, hello, Paul. Uh, thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, APRU Sustainable Waste Management Global Lecture Series is designed to provide a sound foundation in basic principles and unifying research across ecology to conservation and environmental health to waste management, while paying more attention to environmental, social, and governance and global sustainability. Particularly, some related topics will be discussed through April Sustainable Waste Management Global Lecture Series, focusing on EPLA and ESG. The key topic of April uh, Sustainable Waste Management Global Lecture Series are conservation, ecology, environmental health, environmental resource management, sustainable waste management, global sustainability, and medical waste. So as you know, uh, our program has consistently try to carry out a variety of programs designed to accelerate academic activity and international cooperation. So our lecture series is actually a part of regular range of events offered by our program and is designed to offer the audience an inside view of cutting edge research topics. So I believe uh, participants will be able to learn from and interact with world renowned scientists around the world through the lecture series I also hope that this event will become a valuable opportunity to extend and share uh, friendship among those who participate uh, in the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Now we'll move to the seventh lecture of Global Lecture Series. I would like to invite Professor Juhan Oh from International Health Policy and Management at Seoul National University, College of Medicine to introduce the today's speaker. Before starting the lecture, uh, uh, I would like a brief introduction about uh, Professor Withers. The Professor Withers is the director of Global Health Program of the Association of pa uh, Pacific Rim University Opera. She's based at uh, USC Institute on Inequality in Global Health. And also, she's an uh, associate professor at the Keck School of Medicine at the Department of Preventive Medicine of that uh, university. Also, Dr. Withers received a PhD from the Department of uh, Community Health Science at UCLA Building School of Public Health uh, with a minor in cultural anthropology. And also she earned a master's degree in health sciences from the Department of International Health from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and bachelor degrees uh, in international development from uh, UC Berkeley. Dr. Wither uh, is an uh, editor of the two books. One is uh, Global Perspectives on Sexual and Reproductive Health Across the Life Course. And the other book, uh, Global Health Readership, the Case Studies from the Asia Pacific. She has published more than 40 scientific articles and then she serves as an editorial board of six international global uh, health journals. And also she uh, maintains a blog on human trafficking titled Modern Day Slavery 
for uh, Psychology Today. Now uh, it is time for Professor Withers. Uh, Professor Withers, uh, please kindly start your uh, talk. Hey everyone, I would like to thank Professor Oak and his team for this invitation to speak to you today. My talk is titled Promoting Health and Wellness in the Global Workforce. And I know it may not be the typical uh, topic that you often uh, hear about in this global health series, but I hope that you will enjoy it. So let me go ahead and share my slides with you. Okay, here we go. So let's talk about the consequences of ill health and premature mortality um, in terms of economic. So economic growth and development really depend on making sure that we have a healthy workforce. And we know that poor health will inhibit one's ability to be productive. Um, and so that affects society, that affects individuals and, and households, and it also affects corporations. And so, you know, we want to make sure uh, that we are promoting health. And uh, thinking about the cost of ill health it, to, you know, economics, it's greater than 12 billion US dollars a year. Uh, and that's 15% of the global GDP. So think about yourself. Uh, how many hours a week do you spend working? Well, if you're lucky, it's maybe 40, but it probably is more like 50 or even 60 or more hours. So over a lifetime, think of how many hours that total is. All right. So the total actually is most of the world's population spends about a third of their adult lives at the workplace. This means that it is a key place for health promotion and health programs. So we need to promote healthy workforces through workplace wellness initiatives. And it makes sense to, um, to corporations. Because in the US, the cost of replacing an employee who may leave or have you know, absenteeism due to illness costs between 33 and 150% of that person's annual salary. Also, uh, you know, corporations, um, when they lose these workers, they may become less competitive and certainly it hurts employee morale. So improving health of workers has many, many benefits. For every dollar spent on workplace wellness, companies are going to save about $3 in medical costs and $3 in absenteeism costs. And many studies have shown that in investing in employee health through workplace wellness programs offer significant benefit in terms of the return on investment. So companies that offer these programs show improved employee productivity, decreased absenteeism, improved morale, improved health of their workforce, and reduced overall healthcare costs. I also want to touch upon gender equality in this because it's important for us to recognize that we need to have healthy um, workers who are women uh, in the workforce and to support those who want to return after having babies. But we know there are significant obstacles to that. Globally, women earn about 77% of what men earn. And we see differences in uh, you know, gender in terms of labor laws in both developing and developed economies. So there was one study that, um, that I found really interesting that found that over 2.7 billion women are legally restricted from having the same choice of jobs as men. 
So of the 189 economies that this research looked at, 104 of them still had laws preventing women from working in certain sectors or specific jobs. 59 of these economies had no laws on sexual harassment in the workplace. And if you can believe it, 18 economies still had laws that said husbands could legally prevent their wives from working at all if they wanted to. We know that women tend to spend about two and a half times more time on unpaid work, things like taking care of children and households, taking care of elderly parents, for example, um, as opposed to men. And if, if this amount of labor was assigned a monetary value, it would actually constitute between 10 and 39% of the global GDP. We also know that women tend to re, uh, put back, uh, reinvest the money that they make when they have paid work back into their families, much more so than men. So women working has a positive impact on households and our society. And I wanted to show you this. Uh, this is a study from McKinsey that looked at gender parity in, in terms of the workforce. And they found that we could add um, a staggering 28 trillion US dollars to the global GDP by 2025, if we had gender parity in the workforce. That means if women participated both in developed and developing countries in the workforce at the same rate as men, working the same number of hours, um, employing the same you know, level of, of hours or levels as men, making the same amount of money. In this scenario, $28 trillion uh, or 26% of the global GDP could be added by 2025. That's roughly the equivalent of the Chinese and US economies combined. And even without this complete gender equity, if they were just um, doing as well as their best neighbor, we could still add 12 trillion US dollars uh, to the economy, to the global economy, right, GDP, by 2025. So we know that to prosper, we need to support women in the workforce, including making sure that they're supported when they want to return back. So there aren't a lot of studies on this globally, but I, I did find one by Buck Consultants. It shows that it looked at all of the corporations that had in, um, you know, workplace wellness programs. And globally, it showed that about only 29% of organizations had comprehensive health and wellness strategies for their employees. And you can see that it, gen, uh, it um, is, you know, regional differences, it really varies. So we see in North America, 76% of them had these programs, whereas in Latin America, Europe, uh, Asia, it was around, you know, 40 something percent and even lower in other parts of the world. They also looked at the motivations to offer workplace wellness. And again, they varied quite a bit by region. Globally, the primary motivation for employees to offer these programs was to supposedly improving productivity. But regionally, these you know, primary objectives varied quite a bit. So you can see in Asia, it was around you know, employee morale and engagement um, and safety. Also, Australia was big into safety, whereas in the US, where we don't have national health care, it was about reducing health care costs or insurance premiums. And in Latin America, it was more about reducing employee absences. So you were introduced already to the Global Health Program through the Association of Pacific Rim Universities or APRU. But just as a reminder, APRU is a global 
It's a nonprofit network of now 60 leading research universities in the Asia Pacific. And it represents 19 economies, including the world's uh, three largest, represents more than a half a million staff and many more than 2 million students. The Global Health Program, which is housed at the University of Southern California and which I direct, uh, was launched in 2007. And we have a number of initiatives, educational and research. And so we decided, hey, why don't we assess? Why don't we take an inventory of our university's workplace wellness programs and look at the gaps and challenges and where we could make some recommendations. After all, universities are often one of the largest, if not the largest employers in their cities and sometimes even countries. So in terms of our survey, the objectives, we had three. We wanted to assess the range and scope of workplace wellness programs, evaluate gaps and challenges, and identify strategies uh, to better promote them. So we developed a very comprehensive survey, more than 90 questions, and we emailed the online link to uh, representatives from these different universities, both at the Global Affairs Office and the Office of Employee Health. At that time, there were 50 members of APRU. And we asked the, the representatives to specifically focus on employee health and well being, not necessarily on students or programs for students, and not necessarily on occupational safety, but more on employee health and well being. So we had a total of 28 universities that completed this survey. You could see it, them highlighted there in red. And they came from 13 different economies in the Asia Pacific, representing collectively more than 300,000 staff. Most of the universities that participated were very large in public institutions. So more than half employee, employed between 2,500 and 10,000 faculty and staff. So I'm gonna tell you just quickly what, the, what we looked at. So there were different categories. We looked at the benefits that they offered to employees, like you know, human resource benefits. We looked at specific workplace wellness program, design management and information questions. We also looked at six program uh, categories, physical fitness, nutrition and weight, mental health and stress, family support, chronic disease and safety. So I wanted to share with you first some results about workplace wellness design and management of these programs and really highlighting some key areas uh, of, of work. So most of the organizations had dedicated paid employees. They had a dedicated budget specifically for workplace wellness, uh, but most of them did not offer any protected time for employees to engage in these um, programs like during the work week. And most did have a dedicated website, but they were not using a lot of modes to disseminate the information. They were only about a quarter were using any mobile application. Um, text messaging was also very low, social media and printed materials or billboards also quite low. They also, in terms of data to evaluate the impact of these programs, had a lot of gaps. So although more than 70% said they tracked users, when we asked about the number of users in specific program categories, they didn't really have that information. So it was clear maybe they were guesstimating uh, the number of users, but not really systematically tracking this. 
They also weren't looking uh, very often at things like user satisfaction. Okay, so also in terms of motivation and priorities, participants were asked to rank the importance of six health topics in terms of what they offered to employees for health and wellness. And they said that chronic diseases was listed as top priority and smoking cessation or um, and safety programs uh, were supposed to be last priority. They were also asked to rank motivation and they said overwhelmingly that the motivations focus on improving employee morale, but also they needed to comply with national laws and they wanted to reduce risk of uh, you know, workplace injury. And then in terms of challenges, the, the three top challenges were low engagement of employees in these programs, followed by not enough money to support the programs and a lack of leadership engagement in the programs. So now let's take a look at some specific categories. I just wanna highlight some of our findings here. For physical fitness, among the most common physical fitness uh, you know, programs, were things like fitness competitions, charity runs, uh, intramural sports teams, access to gyms on campus, uh, and you know, availability of fitness classes for employees. A lot of campuses also made efforts to specifically promote walking, and biking among employees. But I want you to note that for many of these you know, challenges and events, they were kind of one-off annual fitness runs or some kind of one-day competition. It wasn't something that was a regular occurrence. So looking at the category of nutrition and weight, you can see that among the most common were specific policies about the foods that could be served on campus. These included requiring a certain number of healthy food choices or making calorie counts visible on menus, uh, those kinds of things. But most, less than a third had uh, written or educational materials online about healthy weight. Uh, most did not offer weight reduction management uh, or support weight loss competitions. So now let's look at the topic of mental health and stress. So interestingly, uh, most campuses, so 70 something percent said they have quiet areas for rest like green spaces, um, but they did about a third of them did not have any kind of recreational activities like ping pong where employees could go uh, or yoga, meditation. Very, very few had sleep programs addressing adequate sleep and only about one in five or one in four had screening for mental health issues that was mandatory for employees. Either all employees are certain employees. Now here's where the policies supporting women in the workplace come into play for those re who want to have families. So probably due to laws, most uh, employers had paid maternity and paid paternity leave, but less than 60% offered breastfeeding support and about, about the same amount had on-site childcare, either for, for fees or for free. So about 46% offered it, but for a fee and only two offered it um, or 7% for a fee. Now let's look at chronic diseases. Remember, 
chronic diseases cause the biggest burden in terms you know, of health problems around the world and certainly in the Asia Pacific. I wanna focus your attention, attention specifically on smoking. Smoking rates are really, really high in the Asia Pacific, uh, among the highest in the world, 40, 50, 60% of males in many of these countries uh, like China, Indonesia, et cetera, smoke. Yet only 60% of campuses were smoke-free and less than half had any smoking cessation programs for their employees. In addition, it seems like health screening would be another easy one to implement. Something like blood pressure checks, cholesterol checks, those kinds of things but only 14% of employers offered that. Now let's look at safety. So the most common safety related programs were things like, you know, fire drills, earthquake drills, CPR training, having emergency phones or hotlines, security guards, having campus police patrols, those kinds of things. But I wanted to draw your attention to specifically um, violence and discrimination. So programs relating to domestic violence support or prevention, very few, just above a third have those. Mandatory sexual harassment training, whether it was online or uh, in person, less than half. And those that did have it, often it was like a, let's, you know, let's train every employee when we hire them for one hour online and never talk about this again. We only had about half that reported programs relating to workplace violence. And less than 70 percent has a, had a designated employee to investigate any sexual harassment or discrimination claims. So these are areas, again, where we need a lot of work. So what were the recommendations? Well, we found that legislation, national laws mandating certain programs like smoke-free campuses or sexual harassment training, uh, those were big incentives for universities to comply. Uh, we need regular in-depth and mandatory sexual harassment training and not just when someone initially gets hired. We also need formal protocols for handling complaints of discrimination or harassment. Well, in terms of motivating employees to participate, well, motivation supposedly focused on employee morale, but it didn't seem to align with the actual programs that were more about safety and compliance. Most of the programs were token, often one-off programs or like, oh, we have a green space or, oh, we have a gym, but not comprehensive or strategically designed programs. So it's unclear whether these programs even were meeting employee needs and priorities because very little data is being collected to measure track participation or satisfaction. So we need more data and a um, more strategic way of thinking about this holistically. Also, what, how can employees participate if they've never even heard about this, right? So a lot more incentives in terms of um, protected time to participate and utilizing more avenues to disseminate the information like text messages, mobile apps, websites, social media. Wow, non-communicable chronic diseases, right, lead to a substantial amount of mortality and morbidity worldwide and certainly in the Asia Pacific. And uh, chronic diseases are now a major cause of death and disease um, around, you know, around the world. And the Asia Pacific has more than half of the world's 1.1 billion smokers. Yet there was little being done. We need more in terms of screening, health screening, more in terms of smoking bans and cessation programs. And we also found, you know, 
we're seeing rising mental health issues across the world. And in fact, current predictions, the WHO says that depression will be the leading contributor to the global burden of disease by 2030. So we need more work in this area also. And finally, we need, in terms of recommendations, more programs focusing on safety for women and for women to return to work. Things like uh, professional development, flexible work hours, breastfeeding support, childcare, and more um, you know, mentorship. I wanted to draw your attention to our final report, which is available on our website. And we wanted to make this as practical as possible. So throughout our report, you will see that we have spotlights where we highlight certain uh, innovative and interesting programs that might be easy for other universities to adopt. So these are spotlights uh, in, in the report. Also, Healthy Women, Healthy Economies is an initiative that comes out of APEC. And they've been doing a lot of work looking at how um, economic growth and development relates to women's health. And they have a really interesting toolkit that focuses on five key topics. Workplace wellness is one of them, but there are also related topics like work-life balance, gender-based violence, et cetera. So I would encourage you to also check that out. Finally, uh, I just wanted to tell you a couple of things that are coming up uh, relating to the Global Health Program, APRU Global Health Program that you might be interested in. Our key theme for this year's annual conference is urban health. The conference is being held online November 16th to 18th and is being organized by the University of Hong Kong. A registration is now open. So if you're interested, please sign up for that. We have a number of student initiatives as well, including a student poster contest where we award undergraduate and graduate categories, including cash prizes. The deadline for that is August 31st, so it's coming up. We also have recently held a student global climate change simulation with a number of universities and external partners like UN Habitat, Adidas, uh, Rebalance Earth, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and we'll probably be offering that again next year. So if you're interested, let us know. We have a monthly health research ethics case studies group. It's a really informal one hour topic uh, discussion with other people from around the world, both students and faculty are welcome. And the next one is on September 9th at 9 a.m. Hong Kong. The topic is unfair inducement in research. We also have a mini a certificate in health research ethics, a 12 hour program over one month in October, including three two hour, very interactive sessions with expert facilitators and you get to talk in small breakout rooms. Um, and so that is also open. A Couple more things, we have a, an annual virtual global health case competition this year's case is focused on technology and the COVID-19 infodemic. Our competition opens in March and the prize is, was US $1,000 this year for the uh, top winning team. And I know this is an you know, old slide, but we do have a teaching in virtual environment webinar series, which will begin in October again for faculty who want to improve uh, their teaching. And so it's a professional development activity that's also free and, well, and you're welcome to join. Here are my references. If you would like to contact me, there's my email. The APRUglobalhealth.org is the site where you can find more information about the program. So thank you again for the invitation. Take good care, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining the Global Lecture Series. Um, this is the 
uh, end of the seventh session of the Global Lecture Series. And I would like to extend my sincere gratitude and appreciation to Professor uh, Withers, Ms. Schoenleba, uh, Professor O, and Professor Oak for your valuable contribution and for sharing your knowledge with us during your busy schedules. I would also extend my special thanks to Professor Yongju Oak for organizing this event. Thank you to all the panelists, the program leader, and all the participants for attending this event and bringing your expertise to this gathering. Thank you again and have a great day.